Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton, Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's live stream. It's all about the Supply Chain Buzz, where Greg and I are going to be tackling some of the biggest developments and news that have taken place in recent days. Uh, Greg, folks should stay tuned as we look to increase their supply chain IQ, right? They should. Some of these developments are in recent hours. Uh, I think moving this to noon, while it's a little bit later in the day for folks um, across the pond and mm. around the world, um, we get a lot more of the updated, the released today kind of news. So stay Agreed. tuned. Agreed. And it's nice not to be able to, not to have to get up at 4 a.m. Eastern. Also day. that. <laughs> okay. But hey, to our audience, we're still experimenting with the time frame. So, so feel free to submit your feedback to us and let us yeah. know what you prefer. All right, so Greg, what we're going to do, as we always do, is talk about this day in history, right? Yeah, and love to, that. to do that, let's bring up uh, a little graphic here. Uh, Greg, take a wild guess. What do you think that that contraption does? So I have a bit of an advantage here because in college, one of my jobs was mowing greens at a <laughs> golf course. And so that is a real type mower. Also, my great grandparents made me mow their front yard with a real type mower. That is a really fancy and advanced one. Though. That's okay. right. Well, so what you're looking at. So on this date, May 18th, 1830, Edwin Budding uh, formed wow. an agreement to have his invention, the lawnmower, manufactured. Wow. So uh, get this. Budding was an engineer from Eastington Stroud in southern England. Had to look that up. Uh, he got the idea for a lawnmower after touring a cloth mill, right? A manufacturing site and, and watching a series of clippers come over to the top of the cloth and kind of uh, take some of the burrs, right? Some of the, the, oh. the lesser quality stuff. So this first lawnmower was pushed from behind, but also if you can tell there, it could be pulled. So I guess maybe if you didn't cut your lawn for a month or two, and you, need, you, might, you might need a, two folks to push it and pull it as it was doing its business. Uh, grass right. clippings, rather than grass clippings like most models are, would be gathered in the back, it was collected on the front end. Um, so I'll tell you what, when I read this article, and again, this is May 18th, 1830. Uh, it reminded me of where I spent most of my time on this uh, snapper rear engine rider, which in the 80s, I was on that thing more off, more on oftentimes on Saturdays, right? As a preteen driver, I only hit six trees and took out two cats. So that wasn't too bad, Greg. I got to tell you that it, that it, that is a really stark realization that the real mower was invented in 1830 and my great grandparents were still using one in the 1970s. So, <laughs> not, and not nearly this sophisticated and they still exist. The, the plain old push kind still exists to this day. Uh, really interesting. I wonder what people did to clip their lawn before that. <laughs> no, no idea. Goats? Goats? Maybe. <laughs> All right. So I uh, want to say hello to uh, Richard on LinkedIn is saying Snapper is the pride of McDonough, Georgia. That's right. They had a big, big site there for a number of years. Wow. Um, good stuff there. All right. So let's keep driving. Um, well, first off, Greg, what did you, you know, when you got your first house, what did you cut the grass with? What model do you remember? First house. Yeah. Um, I, I borrowed my neighbor's lawn boy. Do you remember that brand? <laughs> I assume it's still out there because my, I remember feeling like we were rich when my mother finally bought a lawn boy, which is kind of like the Kirby of lawn mowers. Nice. And, um, so I don't recall if we bought a lawn boy, but I remember that we borrowed one for sure. <laughs> hey, learn something new every day. And hello, Susan Moody, who also joined us on the LinkedIn feed. Uh, all right. So on this day in history, 1953, May 18th, 1953, Jackie Cochran became the first female to break the sound barrier. So you take a wild guess uh, in terms of miles per hour. What's the sound? What's breaking the sound barrier require, Greg? Wild 714 guess. miles an hour. Wow, that is a great guess. So in case you're curious, the speed of sound in dry air at about 68 degrees is 767 miles per hour. Or oh, wow. I've been, I've been misunderestimating it for years. <laughs> so uh, a pioneer of women's aviation and really a great business leader, uh, Jackie Cochran, flew an F-86 Sabre III 
on loan from Canada to break the record or bro- break the barrier. Uh, in fact, the U.S. government refused to lend Jackie Cochran an aircraft to do it, which I found interesting. Um, history shows, but, but you know, Jackie Cochran wasn't just an incredible pioneer in women's aviation. She was also an outstanding business leader. The AP, Greg, named her Woman of the Year in Business two consecutive years, 53 and 54. Wow. So it's been told that whatever she, with the exception of one election for Congress, which was a nail biter, she was successful in just about anything she tried. Do we know what her business was? I'm curious, really curious. Uh, For my uh, cursory research, it was uh, retail and specifically, I think, uh, cosmetics. She was involved in in, uh, growing cosmetics firms. But I think that probably doesn't do it justice. How how was she a military pilot? I'm curious. How do you get qualified to fly a jet if you're not a military pilot? Greg, especially in 53, right? (laughs) We're going to have to offer up the the rest of the story. Maybe I'll tell you. I mean, it takes... However it was, you can bet in those days she had to fund that training herself. That's right. That's right. right. Uh, that's pretty impressive stuff. It is. And, and, and by the way, that snapshot there to the left for folks that are tuned in where they can see the live stream, that's, that's Chuck Yeager, who was yeah. the first male, of course, to break the sound barrier. So what a great team there. I uh, want to give a quick shout out to Kathy Morrow Robertson. Hello, Kathy. She's tuned in, I think, via YouTube, I'm sure, between research and, and other projects. Kathy hit a home run on the uh, Vetlana breakout session that KPMG hosted last week on the future supply chain, by the way. So good stuff there, Kathy. All right. So Greg, let's talk about what this day is across the world, right? May 18th, Victoria day in Canada, right? Our friends to the North Baltic fleet day in Russia, victory day in Sri Lanka. Uh, Internationally it's world AIDS vaccine day. And a uh, lot, lot of May 10th was a busy, busy day across the world. Yeah, no kidding. We've got uh, Patrick Kelly is tuned in via LinkedIn Live. Hello, Patrick. Looking forward to reconnecting with you and uh, the Produce Podcast. I get some some of those notifications just about every day as they release new episodes. Good stuff there. Um, all right, so so Greg, with all that uh, said, I want to dive into the buzz, huh? Yeah, let's do it. All right, As usual, so, when we dive into the buzz and we talk about supply chain, what are we going to talk about? Toilet paper. <laughs> Toilet TP. paper is like ideas. Everybody's got some. That's right. um, and in most cases, more than they need. Uh, so this is from a Fortune article. And I know toilet paper probably sounds like old hat to us in the supply chain trade, but some interesting, an interesting look back and an interesting perspective from some experts and observers in supply chain. So, um, and I think it also uh, produces an interesting perspective that we as supply chain professionals need to think about. But let's talk about the story first. Um, On March 13th, 2020, sales were up 734% over the same day last year. Wow. Does anyone know what happened a day or two earlier uh, prior to March 13, 2020? I see the no hands raised. WHO announced that coronavirus was a global pandemic. And Scott, you and I and the Supply Chain Now team, we were still at Modex. Um, a trade show, the probably the last trade show, last physical trade show actually done. Um, and I recall on the drive home having the discussion, should we go get stuff um, mm. at that point? But in, in any case, that was a huge uh, uplift. And about, f- f- uh, according to the article, about 40% of the increase is attributable to additional home use. And that's relevant based on uh, going to a point that we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. By March 23rd, 70% of U.S. grocery stores were out of stock. Um, And the article further goes, the article author, Jen Vichner. Mm -hmm. um, I think you nailed it. Something like that. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jen. (laughs) Um, The perception that there is a shortage later becomes a reality. And that's that really goes to a lot of what we're experiencing. Um, some 
you know, I think what we're seeing is that recovery has been slow because of the level of panic. Demand overall up until about May 2 is still 75% higher than than normal demand for the same period from March 13th to May 2nd mm -hmm. uh, in the past year, or actually on average. So that even considers some other peaks in demand as well. The argument in the Fortune article is that supply chain is broken and, and it's difficult to recover. And I think there are some issues, of course, in how to understand and communicate that demand back upstream. But I think that goes to the farther discussion. And this is switching to opinion here, but also, ex also experience um, that one, people weren't running out of paper. And I don't, I know a lot of people and I don't know anyone who's out of toilet paper, right? The stores mm -hmm. are out of toilet paper. And, and one of the uh, uh, assertions made in the article is that the demand, the demand was shifted forward by people hoarding and panic buying. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's arguable that that's the case. Some people have argued that um, it was because of the fact that people weren't going to work and and um, and having there's a really interesting euphemism that the industry uses that I want to make sure that I capture. And I'm sorry I didn't write that down, but um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I think that there's a video in the article from from Fortune Magazine. Is that we're playing that? Yes. Okay. That's probably what we're hearing. Yeah, okay. Everyone's got to have video oh. these days. Yeah, well, that's good. If you want to hear from the author, not a supply chain expert, but if you want to hear from the, the journalist who made the article, it's in, it's in the article there. But in any case, um, the uptick in demand is only attributable by about 40% to people being home instead of being in uh, at work in restaurants or out in public elsewhere. So still the demand was significant. And I think this goes to the further point that, and this is something we need to really strongly consider as supply chain professionals. And that is that the consumer is part of the supply chain. And in fact, the supply chain begins and at this point ends with the consumer. So if we, as we talk about circular economy and we talk about demand, we need to think about the consumer as part of the supply chain. That's right. Um, and by doing that, what we'll recognize is it goes to a further supplemental article that um, is in another, uh, another one that I looked at this morning that says the whiplash effect is about to come home. And as production catches up, there will be a glut, a surplus of toilet paper in the stores relatively shortly. Some experts, supply chain experts from Syracuse and South Florida both um, have, have stated that as well in, an, in another article. So if we recognize that consumers are part of the supply chain, we recognize that while there is a shortage in the marketplace, there is not a toilet paper shortage. Mm -hmm. unless, some, unless there is a mass of people who are not reporting their inability to have or hold toilet paper because I can tell you there's not a shortage in our household. I mean, it's not like we're hoarding, right? but, but it is hard for the supply chain to keep up and catch up right now. Right. Yeah. Good stuff there. Um, in fact, you know, uh, Clay, the dog is one of our quarterbacks. He's behind the scenes as well as Amanda, our CMO. And, and Amanda just shared with me that uh, while we were at Modex, she had just placed an order for TP to be delivered. So uh, as we we're driving home and thinking about supplies, fortunately, our forecast at the Luton residence was dead on the money. So, yeah. and we, and we refused to hoard. In fact, uh, kidding aside, I think, uh, Amanda, it was a month later, maybe three weeks later before we, you know, needed to place our, our, our next order, which just enough, right? It, it wasn't multiple yeah. packages. We tried not to give in. Um, hey, real quick, want to say hello to uh, Bear202014, who's tuned in via uh, uh, Twitter, I believe. Also, Benjamin Goldclang, a, a regular listener here on The Buzz, as, as well as one of our fierce competitors on Supply Chain Trivia, which we'll talk about that at yeah, near the end right. of today's show. And Muhammad Hassan is tuned in via LinkedIn's live. So great to have I you. Think also a competitor on trivia. I think you're right. I think, I think, yeah. uh, you know, we, we, we've got a he tribe. Some other shows. I know that it's happening 
<laughs> we have a tribe of tri of trivia super competitors for sure. Yeah. For All sure. right. So let's keep driving here. We're going to dive into the second story. And and Greg, you didn't have anything to say before we leave this first one about the Dallas Cowboys fan in the graphic. I'm, I am surprised that we didn't get a Greg White witticism on that. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even notice that. You even mentioned that pre-show, and I did not <laughs> notice that that was a, a Dallas hat. <laughs> so I know our friend Tevin Taylor. Tevin Taylor, who we've already talked to, so we've already had the chance today to gig him for both for being a Cowboys and an A&M Aggies fan. That's so. right. That's right. All right. So we'll keep driving. Uh, we won't <laughs> we won't step on any, any of Tevin's toes. Hello to Pierre and Manish, uh, who are both tuned in via LinkedIn as well. All right. So moving right along into our second story. So, um, you know, Greg, of course, there's a lot, a lot of talk around reshoring and nearshoring manufacture as a result of the pandemic environment. A lot of moving pieces right. there. Um, you know, however, as we, you and I both know, and a lot of folks in the supply chain industry understand that it's, it's not quite that simple, right? Global supply chain is very complex. So this story here that comes to us from uh, CNN Business uh, shed some light on one such complex supply chain, and that is generic drugs. So check this out. So for starters here in the U.S., 90% of all subs, uh, prescriptions are filled by generic drugs, right? And for good reason. The biggest reason, perhaps, is the average 80 to 85% price break between generic and branded drugs, right? Right. But did you know that one in three generic pills taken by Americans is produced by generic pharma manufacturers in India? Did you know that? I didn't know that. Um, you knew that. Greg, well, Greg is I, worked, I worked with Henry Schein uh, when I started a previous company, so I'm pretty familiar with the dynamics of that supply chain. We'll get into that yes. in a second here. Well, as usual, Greg is uh, three steps ahead of me, which uh, I'm used to by now. All right. I'm a so, know-it-all, aren't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. So if you move, let's move a little bit further upstream in, in the generic drug supply chain. You're going to find that India gets about 68% of its raw materials, in this case, APIs, from China. And, right. and you know, if we all, there's probably a short list of, of acronyms that we all are learning, whether you're in supply chain or consumers through this pandemic environment and, and API is on that list, right? Active pharmaceutical ingredients, essentially. Right. That's the, the core foundational ingredients of, of any medicine. That's right. Uh, absolutely. Basically the raw materials used to make pharmaceuticals. So this year it's been really challenging to protect, uh, protect that flow of APIs, which are critical to, to making these drugs from China into India. Consider this. So, of course, in January, China entered a lockdown. Uh, many Indian firms, any man manufacturers were really scrambling. In fact, I saw reports where they were going into local markets and paying a huge price for a smaller batch just to keep these production lines going. In March, as China opened back up, the challenges shifted less about supply and really more about getting it through all of these local border shutdowns, right? It became more of a logistics issue. In fact, yeah, it, it is. I think it's moved over land to India from China, right? It does not go on the ocean. So API imports into India from China were down some 40% in March, according to Indian government officials. So the question is, and we, we talked about this in, I think, the last couple buzzes, right, as we're trying to navigate through what really should be reshored versus this, right. this mantra that may not be well grounded and well reconnected. You can't move everything back to the states. You, you so just can't. It is. It's a great initiative. It really is. But we need to temper it with some reality. That's and right. frankly, tempering it with that reality will allow us to be more effective at making as much of it as we possibly can happen. Great point. You got to be realistic about this, and and, and you you can't. Uh, and you need to do your homework, right? There's a lot of folks that are weighing in without. Perhaps I'm not making any accusations, but perhaps I don't have a full understanding of global uh, complex supply chains and why they're overseas. And, and that's not a that's just a very generic comment. So so what do we do from here with all of these lessons learned and what's come to the surface? So here's two things. So in India, uh, let's see here in India, you know, back during the 2008 Beijing Olympics, you know, the Chinese government wanted uh, to create that blue skies initiative, right? As we had all these world visitors flock to Beijing. So they shut down a lot of these API manufacturers and lots of other industry for three weeks. 
So naturally back in 2008, that Indian manufacturing firm scrambling, right? And, and there was a lot of talk at the time of creating what they called a mega pharma park, right? To help prevent these, these massive changes uh, and, and, and really repercussions from them. Well, that idea was largely shelved because of lack of investment or perhaps lack of investment interest. Well, that idea is back on the table uh, because of these recent challenges they've had. And in fact, so much so that a $1.3 billion package has been introduced in uh, via the Indian government to make this mega pharma park happen. Hmm. So we don't have time to go into all the details, but it really, it'll limit their uh, dependence on going over or going to other countries for the API ingredients. Wow. So that's India, right? We'll see. We'll keep our finger on the pulse of that. We'll see how that that plays out and, and see if you know ground is broken on this this mega park. Here in the States, a little different. Uh, on March 19th, a group of members in the US Congress introduced the quote, protecting our pharmaceutical supply chain from China Act, end quote. Um, it calls That's pretty specific, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. From China. So get this and take a guess for what year. So it calls for the elimination of API and finished drug purchases from China by what year? Take a wild guess. I just did an article around some of this. I don't recall the, I don't recall the specific year, but it's really soon, like 2023 or something. Yes, ridiculous. you're right. 2023 is less than three years from now. Now, um, that's just about impossible. I mean, let, let's just face it. And plus to your point that you've stated in earlier shows, do you really want the government moving that fast? Because you don't. That's an excellent point. Yeah, that's right. You're not, you're not really sure of all the repercussions, but um, let's say they're successful in 10 years. Let's let's triple that. Right. Let's say they're successful in 10 years. I got to ask, what's going to replace the inexpensive drugs that so many Americans rely on that are on fixed incomes? And has that been You know, what's going to be the, the substitute for that? Uh, and I, I don't want to sound. Uh, naive, because there's absolutely some things we can do to bring some of these these critical um, uh, uh, drugs back and, and reshore certain elements. But you know, they're one of the biggest reasons why a lot of the, a lot of supply chains are global in nature is because some of the price gains, right, Greg? Indeed. I mean, if you look at a couple things, one, if if we could do it here ch cheaper, we would be. And in fact, a lot of our pharmaceutical production was done in Puerto Rico for many, many years. The big pharma companies had um, R&D and production facilities in Puerto Rico, which stand completely idle now. So there's an opportunity potentially to bring that back. That's right. But even then in Puerto Rico, we must have felt like the, the I know there were government incentives and things like that, but we must have felt like the labor was a bit expensive to do that. Yeah. But yeah, the, it is highly, um, cost driven. One of the other dynamics that we've got to think about is it's not just big farm of being greedy. I'm not going to forgive them. Um, but it isn't solely that. The other thing that I learned from working with Henry Schein is that the reason that goods are so a portion of the reason that goods are so expensive in the States is because we have to provide them to Africa and South America and other third world portions of, of the planet in at a price that they can afford because the pharma companies actually care about saving lives. And in fact, in some countries, there are government regulations as to how much you can charge for these things. So we, the North America and particularly the United States, we are subsidizing a lot of those countries getting life saving drugs by paying more here. Yeah. Good, um, good point, so we've got to think about that, right? Yep. How um, do we reconcile that? And, you know, and we're, so we're going to keep our finger on the ball uh, on the pulse here. And what's interesting is our third story, which we'll touch on in just a second, is, is um, you know, we try to give you the whole story here, right? Not one side, but but different examples, points and counterpoints, because it's just not that easy to weigh in. It's not a black and white issue. But before we move into uh, this third story, Greg, let's give a quick shout out. We've got some folks uh, that are pinging us. We've got Stacy Adelman, uh, Adelman, right? Adelman. From Illinois. Hello, Stacy. Great to have you here. I like your new uh, avatar on yeah. Facebook. Uh, by the way, Stacy has done some incredible graphic design for the Supply Chain Now team. So I uh, hope you and your oh. family are doing well. Stacy, great to have you. Cool. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, of course, one of our favorites that we wouldn't memory. be there of having a buzz without memory, uh, a supply chain practitioner in South Africa. Great to have you here, memory. Looking forward to reconnecting with you later this week. And we had one quick comment along these lines, uh, or two quick comments. So Gerald, uh, Gerald Jackson, who's on uh, LinkedIn uh, here, says, that's just not realistic. Think about the cost, profitability, and which company, great question, which company wants to take the margin hit? Good question there, Gerald. And one more question from our friend, Claudia, Claudia Freed. who will be on the live stream tomorrow with us. <laughs> along with Chuck Easley with uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, she says, uh, pro, uh, pro, <laughs> Propofol. Propofol. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. I'm guessing. <laughs> so this drug supply chain, most complex example of pharma reports Bureau of Investigative Journalism. So uh, I guess it, it'll be interesting to see what that very complex global supply chain for Propofol and, and, and what, decisions are made with that, where to change where it's sourced, where to change where, you know, some of it production's made. I don't, I don't know, Claudia, we'll see. I wish I had more answers and questions. So let's not wrap this without a couple of points. And one is, um, and I completely agree with, is it Gerald? I, I agree with that. Um, if they were willing to take the hit, they would have stayed in Puerto Rico when the initiatives went away, right? Um, but the the thing that we have to think about is it's not just not China. It's, it may be, or reshoring, it may be nearshoring, multiple sourcing. Multiple sourcing is, is the solution. That's right. We should never, ever, regardless of what that region of the world is, we should never, ever rely on one country, one region of the world, one source for supply. Even if we do 80% of the demand in, in, some area of the world and then split the rest of it among a couple of others. That's just prudent supply chain management. And there have been companies that have been doing that for years, not always in, in pharma, but um, generic has long been a sort of race to the bottom. Um, it, you know, first of all, we have to understand that generic go goods don't exist. Generic drugs don't exist until the 20 or 25 years at, after a patent is issued for a drug. Mm. So then it's a number of somewhere between entrepreneurial and purely opportunistic companies who go and build this stuff on the cheap and then provide it to the marketplace to undercut. It's why we have um, all of the OTC, so many of the OTC goods on the market as well. And also some of the prescription goods that are the generic brand. And that's why there are so ge many generic brands of various products on the marketplace. So mm. we have to, we have to get people who are thinking longer term in that, in that generic industry uh, as well. And we have to consider alternative sources. Memories message makes me think of what's the potential of Africa. The cost of labor in Africa is low. There are a multitude of countries. So you don't wind up um, counting on a single country. Of course, there are a lot of issues with some of the governments in those countries, but you pick right. you pick the the most um, faithful players in in that space and start there. South well, America or Central America as well, right? You know, we had we had this part of the report somewhere, and maybe Malcolm can can rescue me here. But some ninety percent of all um, APIs. Well, that, but um, the, the the levels of um, um, generic, like acetaminophen, uh, the amount, the sheer amount of of uh, Chinese produced pharmaceuticals. Not even talking about the India and and the pastor there, come direct from China. I mean, we're talking 70, 80, 90 percent of some of these very common drugs that that we all lean on uh, yep. in various ways, from headaches to to other more serious conditions that require more, you know, on, you know, regular medication. So. You know, this, again, it's not an easy thing. Uh, Greg, I, I can appreciate your um, your medicine background here. I, th I didn't think of that when we were, we were pulling these stories together. So, um, all right, so let's keep driving. And it said, oh, hang on a sec. One more quick. Uh, so, Sarath on LinkedIn says, it is the best time to change the trend. Very interesting. Uh, we're going to see. And, and it will happen. That's I mean, right. 
It, it will undoubtedly happen in, in a lot of industries, but this one in particular. And as it turns out, we're about to talk about similar thing in other industries. <laughs> All right, right. So you've got some interesting data on this uh, manufacturing reshoring uh, yeah. move and, and all the chatter, as well as some some really interesting survey insights related to that topic, right? Yeah. So uh, a Thomas survey uh, of 878 North American manufacturing and industrial sector pros said that 64% of manufacturers are, say, reshoring is likely after the pandemic. Um, again, same type of issue, but not in a specific industry. And a lot of companies are, uh, they recognize it, the differences in um, some of the manufacturing and industrial industries that the, the economic dynamics that impact them are, again, single sourcing. Not, we're not going to belabor that point, but also the logistics, right, and the risk in the supply chain of getting goods from a single source far away where air freight is required to expedite and ocean freight requires uh, larger amounts of, of provisional or safety stock um, because of the 30 to 60 day transit times from your supplier. Mm. It's a very complex supply chain. I don't know who's dealt with sourcing into China, but it's unbelievably um, complex. And, um, you know, and it, it creates a lot of issues for those companies. So um, a lot of companies are, are talking about moving to Mexico, but Mexico has its own difficulties because of various and sundry, arguably, let's, this is the opinion of the industry, mismanagement by the Mexican government between drugs and, and the uh, epidemic or pandemic itself. Those concerns have, have actually played out in the maquiladoras, which, which are the factories just over the border in Mexico that auto parts chains and, and auto parts uh, manufacturers have been using for years. So, and, and, and we should probably think about when you mentioned Mexico and, and, and greater Central America and South America, where they are in their efforts fighting the pandemic are a little bit different than what we're seeing in the States. I was reading an article over, um, over the weekend, specifically talking about Brazil and, and Venezuela, uh, as well as some of the, some of the um, measures that the Mexican government have instituted related mm -hmm. to the automotive manufacturers and some of the parts coming into those plants and, and coming out to uh, American OEM. So, gosh, a lot of moving pieces, right? Yeah, and I think, again, you have to consider nearshoring as well. Um, I, I don't think that Gerald's point is any different in any industry than it is in pharmaceutical. It is that it's difficult to do this and it will take time. I mean, it took time for a lot of this production to go overseas. It seems like it happened overnight, but it didn't. Right. Um, but if we can at least get the goods nearer and in a friendlier, um, in a friendlier country, then we can certainly do it. I mean, uh, Claudia's homeland, Argentina is, has a ton of really talented people. <laughs> I don't just say that cause I've got family there. Um, but they've got a ton of really talented people and we already offshore or nearshore a lot of tech development to countries like Argentina and Chile. Right. Um, and those are relatively stable democracies, right? Um, so, and, and lawful societies. So, you, you know, you want to encourage that and enable entities like that at the same time that you also um, create some sustainability in your supply chain. I, I should say sustainable sourcing in your supply mm -hmm. chain, right? You want to make sure that you've got options and that they are more reliable and friendlier options. So, Hey, um, I, I want to go back for a second because memory touched on something going back to pharmaceuticals that, that you agreed with where we talked about the potential of not, not reshoring, not reshore, not reshoring or nearshoring, but taking advantage of the great workforce in Africa. And memory mm -hmm. says that stable African countries need to be part of the solution to the production of generic drugs. Greg, your take. Absolutely. I mean, what is the draw of China that the average worker makes between 10 and $14,000 a year? Right. It wouldn't even take that to sustain most countries. Now, memory is in South Africa, which has a 
more robust economy, but it, but there are other stable countries as she's talking about, and there are also elements of her own population that mm -hmm. could benefit from a, a wage that is much, much lower than that. Uh, and, uh, and again, we have the opportunity on a massive continent, one of the biggest continents on the planet, to, to spread the wealth and and spread the risk across a multitude of countries. I don't know the count, but there are dozens of countries on the continent of Africa. So we wouldn't be reliant on a, on just Kenya or just South Africa or just right. Tanzania. Or, forgive me, whoever else exists. Opportunity for a lot, lot more, Chad. lot more country. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, and I am trying. Uh, to not bounce around too much on these comments, Greg, but it is, there's a lot of opinion and feedback on, uh, on, on these two stories that we're talking about. Um, before I read off a couple more comments, Greg, did you have any final remarks on story three here about uh, the reshoring survey? I, I don't think so. I think it's, you know, it's the, it's a similar story on a, on a different segment of the economy. And well, let me add this one point. I'm sorry. I am bouncing around. So you don't, you don't have to take the blame. We have to figure out how to make this economical, right? We all want change. And some of us want to shout into the wind, flail at, flail at windmills, like Don Quixote, uh, um, to make change. But the truth is, what we really need to be working on is what creates economical stability in terms of being able to do that. When we do that, we will solve the problem and not one moment sooner. Great point. It has Excellent to be point. economical all the way from the consumer, all the way through the bottom line of a Fortune 500 or 100 company. Yep. All right. So uh, you mentioned Claudia a couple of times, a regular uh, live stream uh, participant. She's going to be on as a featured guest tomorrow. We really And, and, and she's been featured uh, in Supply Chain Now programming dating back to February when we were there at the Reverse Logistics Association event in right. Vegas. So uh, she weighs in on your comments there about uh, Vin, uh, Argentina. Uh, she agrees high level of literacy in, in the workforce there in Argentina, uh, bilingual, uh, and re bilingual, sorry, uh, I'm getting corrected here by <laughs> in studio. Getting corrected uh, in your own language. That's right. Hey, that's not, that's, that's very common, very common bilingual and reasonable time zones. And we've, we've all known about the, when you go worldwide and global, global, how the time zones can, can be challenging to deal with. And Claudia also agrees with memory about we've got to make sure that the state that especially the stable countries in Africa, uh, and we look for stability anywhere in the world, not just to pick on the on that continent, but they yep. should be part of the solution for sure. So great point there, memory and Claudia. Um, all right, so let's move ahead to uh, Barb. Do you remember Barb? Barb Sexton. Yep. Uh, we had a great follow up conversation with Barb, and she asked a good I question. Last week, that's right. So, and Greg, you may, uh, I'm not terribly familiar with um, the tax uh, uh, penalties that she's referring to, but she's, she, Barb asked, hey, why the potential tax penalty to Apple if they move to India from China? You know, I'm not as familiar, I'm not as familiar with that as one of the other vehicles that a lot of big tech, particularly tech companies use, which is called a double Irish Dutch sandwich. Um, I have <laughs> some new one for me. <laughs> it, it's very complex. The simple version is there are two companies in Ireland. One holds the IP. The other pays basically almost 100% royalty to that company, which alleviates tax to uh, owed to the U.S. government. Then another company in the Netherlands is involved somehow. Maybe even Bermuda is involved, and then the money comes back. There are literally trillions um, and just about five years ago, there were about $7 trillion waiting to be repatriated to the States. But because of our, the highest, I think, I think we're still the highest corporate tax in the world or one of the highest corporate taxes. Those companies were imploring the government to do something about it so that they, and they wanted to repatriate that money, but not at a 40% tax rate. I'm not sure if that's related to this somehow, or if there's another one, um, there's another tax. I'd have to look into that and see if India has some greater tax implications than China. Yep. Maybe Barb could, maybe we'll, maybe we should talk to Barb again this week. And, That's right. Right. Hey, world trade is the theme for today on the buzz. 
Yeah. Uh, going back to, I think Pharma, uh, Roche has been in Africa for a few years now as, as our Kathy friend. Robertson. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's right. I don't know who else, um, but it's not, uh, it's, I, and maybe they're experimenting. I don't know what portion of their production is. I'd be interested to see what Kathy has to say on that. But um, I think that's part of Roche's China plus one or China plus two, whatever strategy yep. is to investigate that. And, and we have to do that prudently because as memory alludes to, there are stable governments in Africa and there are others that are not so stable. Yep. All right. So as we wrap up this segment, we're going to wow. take, but yeah, this has been a wild, segment, wild West. Been. We're going to, we're going to talk big stuff. That's right. We're going to get commentary from Gerald Jackson from LinkedIn. And I've got a great question from Benjamin Greg. We'll, we'll weigh in on that. We've, we've talked about a good bit here uh, previously. Okay. So, so Gerald Jackson on LinkedIn says, quote, tech supply chains have looked at nearshore options routinely to cut lead times and working capital. For example, Apple, HP, Dell, Microsoft, Xbox, constantly review options to get supply chains closer to the markets. Infrastructure seems to be a challenge. That's a great point. Mm. Uh, uh, Gerald is, is bringing the heat today. Yeah. We're going to have to get him to weigh in. Sounds like he is in the know. Well, we, I'll tell you what we want to do. We want to involve him in whatever the potential solution is. So I don't know who Gerald Jackson is, but I'm telling <laughs> you, I want him on my team. Jackson I'm, makes it happen. I'm picking him first for kickball. <laughs> well, maybe right. second after Claudia, but there you go. <laughs> All right, so we're going to wrap on this question here, and then we're going to move into a couple of quick observations from over the weekend. So Benjamin, our, our friend Benjamin Goldklang asks, uh, "Will COVID nineteen push more robotic automation with firms that can't relocate but have to adapt with health conscious working conditions?" Greg, I know you're salivating to take this. Go ahead. I can hardly hold myself back. The answer is, um, I believe that it will, and I believe that it should, and I believe that if we ha have any opportunity to reshore what can be produced robotically, we need to, and we need to do it sooner than later. And that is because the largest, um, they're not the largest in the workforce now, but the largest generation in the history of the planet is exiting the workforce at the pace of 10,000 a day, actually much faster considering unemployment right now. But, um, but even just um, organic exit, um, it, they were exiting at a, at a relatively rapid rate. And those sorts of hands-on production jobs are not going to be done by the incoming generations. They want to work with technology. Furthermore, they need to be paid too much to compete with the $3.60 a day, hour, hour that, Chinese workers make $10,000 to $14,000 a year, as we said earlier. So the only way for us to compete is with robotics wherever we can apply robotics. And the beautiful benefit of that that I see is that that will cost not a single American job. Mm. Did we ever think we'd be saying that? No. Right? <laughs> did we ever think that, auto, did we, I mean, think about how full circle we've come there. Automation is going to actually increase jobs, not decrease jobs, because those jobs are going to go away. Mm. They're going to go to cheap labor markets like Africa or China, or they're going to come back here as automated jobs and, yep. and raise the, the well-being, uh, the safety, as was just alluded to, and the, the job satisfaction of employees who will be working with monitoring, ma maintaining, programming, and, and interacting with those um, automation technologies rather than doing the physical, menial, repetitive, right, dangerous work that technology will undertake in the future. Yep. All right. So shifting gears. And by the way, Gerald says, bring in the heat. He'll take it. He, he liked how we described. He was on the money along with Kathy and Claudia. Uh, and memory, you know, you know, this is a, this is a yeah. very shrewd audience that tunes Benjamin into too, yeah. Benjamin, yeah. that's right. All right. So let's shift gears as we wrap up uh, today's edition. Uh, and, and we're going to do this at a, at a higher altitude. You know, I, I am no secret 
of a fan of the Wall Street Journal's Saturday edition. You know, it's such a great, if you like an eclectic mix of news from industry to, you know, living to uh, investing to humans, human stories, it's just, it's, it's got that. It's got something for everybody. So I look forward to getting the hard copy of this every Saturday. So this past weekend, there are three stories that got my attention, but we only have time for two. The third story was, was a editorial on Michael Jordan's leadership uh, approach, which was really an yeah. interesting story. We'll save for another time. But up for, so, um, you know, the first story that really caught my eye and I really enjoyed reading was the end of the office. And Greg, notice there is no question at the end of that title of this article. Excellent point. So uh, Dana, Dana Mattioli and Conrad Putzier do a remarkable job taking a deep dive, you know, really across the industry, speaking with executives that are all determining whether and when to come back to the office, renewing really pricey office space, or considering some really bold shifts into perhaps not coming back. For for example, we talked about this pre-buzz. Mm -hmm. Canadian IT firm Open Text plans to eliminate more than half of its 120 offices globally. Now, that's just one example. They, they they spoke in this article. They spoke with manufacturers. They spoke with uh, consultants. They spoke with some of the um, the real estate firms like the Ward 10X Richmonds of the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting to see a wide variety of takes. I want to get your take, but I, I, one observation and consideration that I want that I would love to get everyone to kind of weigh in on, if you're still with us, is think about. Let's say you're an open text manager, a frontline supervisor, and the world that you've lived in is is you know coming into the office Monday through Friday and seeing your employees with that eyeball accountability and being able to to build that personal rapport in person in good times and in bad, all the different things that management that goes into management. And then that office goes away and all of those responsibilities are still there, but you've got to do it remotely. This is going to be a fascinating time. Uh, to see these organizations that choose to take the path, the path like Open Text evidently does, at least according to the article, and the impact on leadership and management. But Greg, what else are you seeing? Weigh in. Well, you know, in the last company that I ran, we saw a lot of the impact of this coming, and so did lessors um, even before this time frame, because they had a lot of what they were really concerned about what they call phantom leases, which is pro properties that are still being paid for, but not occupied. And one of the things we were talking about was how do we monitor inactivity in an office to know that when it comes to lease renewal, that that's going to go on the market and, and how do these real estate companies and developers, how do they, how do they prepare for that? So yeah. it's actually not surprising. I think this is a, gigantic catalyst in terms of uh, expediting this exodus from the office. But we started hearing about this as soon as the lockdowns came. That's right. Right. I mean, we heard about physical logistics firms who, you know, when asked, how are you going to bring people back into the office? They said, we are not. Right. And I think we have to acknowledge that this was a trend that was going this way anyway. It is, as you said earlier, Scott, it does give people hours back in their day if they'll take them. One of the issues that we have found during the, the pandemic and this seismic societal disruption is that people won't stop working. Right. Some people don't stop working when, you know, and they're working till seven or eight o'clock at night. I can tell you this, and, and she's been a really good sport about it. My wife has brought me dinner in the studio more than once in the last week or two. So well, big shout out to Vicky who Vicky and the whole team, some of the pistons that keep the supply chain now team moving and, 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 you know, and all types of contributions. So thanks for feeding the beast, Vicky. <laughs> well, and yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and I thank her. I thank her every time, by the way. Good, That's good. Um, but, but I think that those dynamics are important because you're also Scott, a big fan and I am too and we've all seen the dynamic of being face to face in the office place and what you would call in the old days, if anyone even knows what this is, is anymore, a water cooler conversation, right? You're passing someone in the hallway, you're standing by the water cooler, you're microwaving your popcorn or salmon um, <laughs> and annoying the whole office. <laughs> but 
you're but you're having that you're having a discussion with somebody where and we talked with memory about this um and and dc uh Montsfregola a couple of weeks ago about how when those dynamics occur the slightest comment can generate an idea or an initiative or a solution great point uh, for a company. And that is going to be sorely missing, which I think goes in some case to your story Second. that's next. Yes. And uh, lots of so many good segues here. So but before we get to the story of innovation, let's uh, Amanda weighs in uh, our CMO here at Supply Chain Now. Uh, after a show me 50 lean in circle call last week, I wonder what this will mean for women who are striving to be seen and heard by their leadership teams in person. Will it mean male leaders will choose to work more closely with those they know, so the buddy system, of course, versus those women who attempt to increase their own visibility and influence when they can chat in the hallways and at the water cooler with higher ups. That is a, a outstanding observation and question, which I, I wish I had a more uh, better answer to. But it's something you got to consider if you do shift over to a, a more a more remote workplace, right? I think it is. And I don't know the answer, but I think that that I think that the hope for women and and divert other diversity groups um, to gain their expertise is that um, is that the people who are less technologically savvy to this this these types of platforms are exiting the workforce pretty right. rapidly, and they may not adapt to these types of, um, of platforms as well. And you'll be able to build that influence with their influencers, if not directly with some of, some of those folks. That's the only thing I think I, I, that's the thing that comes immediately to mind is yep. as, as a possibility. The I other agree. thing is, and there are technologies that exist. I'm not going to mention them here, but there are technologies that exist that give you a virtual physical office experience. And I think we'll see more of that where Agreed. Zoom will be just part or WebEx or go to meeting or will be just part of the solution where you hold comp you hold conference calls and, and meetings and that sort of thing. But the ability to have a virtual water cooler solution will come around. Yeah, love that. Uh, Benjamin says the water cooler is replaced with chat rooms where people can share ideas just like this comment thread. Benjamin, I love that level of optimism and and companies that are serious about doing that and and very practically and successfully engaging their workforce will figure out the digital water cooler approach. And that leads us to our next question from Gerald. Gerald says, will it be a strategic advantage for companies to learn to manage remotely with video cloud metrics and applications be better able to tap into top talent from everywhere, uh, from anywhere and everywhere for that matter. And I would say Gerald, yes, absolutely. I think, you know, we have, we have uh, for a year, for several years now, We've all assumed what digitization means and 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 how far that goes. I would argue that that this article and and the discussions that it will trigger will absolutely start to expand the definition of what true successful in uh, innovative digi digitization means in 2020 and beyond. Because it's not just about products and services being delivered. It's not just about visibility into your operation or global enterprise. It is right. about how you are making sure you are an outstanding organization for folks to work in and succeed in and, and, and where they feel like they're empowered and they're engaged and they're really contributing and it's being appreciated. That's, there's a lot to that, but, but that's my oh. take, Gerald, on your, on your question, Greg. I, I love your hot take and I, I, I'm glad you got one because usually you leave those for me. So I'm seriously, I think <laughs> your insight is really, really strong there. And and I would argue also to Gerald is that if you aren't already experiencing or haven't been for some years, I would say in at least the last three to four years, been experiencing a work environment like we're discussing right now, or even that you're engaging in right this moment, this this type of session, you're already your company is already behind the curve. Mm, great point. Because um, tech companies and other companies who recognize the power of this and who have operated from home, they're looking at this going, "What's the big deal?" Yep. Right? Great I point. mean, I had a company. My last company, Kiro, I think we had a total of eleven people, 
And we had people all over the country. I had vice presidents out in various states. Um, and, and we did make an effort to get physically together. Um, but we had to operate three, three and a half weeks a month virtually. So it can be done. Um, there are some really key learnings that help facilitate it. Um, but it, it is definitely the future and it can be, in my opinion, every bit as productive, saving that one dynamic, that water cooler, that, that, you know, sort of whatever you want to call it, that catalyst right. statement that you can only get physically. And that's why we made such an effort to get together physically once a week. That's right. All right. So Clay talks more. Great point. Uh, Clay says, the dog says here at Supply Chain, now great point that fully in integrating remote work vastly expands the talent pool. And, you know, it is. You, you got to compete for talent. You get your yeah. digitization uh, initiative has to be holistic, which absolutely touches on the talent side. So good stuff there. Clay, great question, Gerald. All right, we got to keep driving. Mem we're going to come back to memories comment if we can here in a moment. But, you know, the end of the office in one article and then talking about innovation can't be forced, but it can be quashed. We're not going to be able to give this second article a really fully throated discussion. But Matt Ridley, this is the author of this second article here I read over the weekend, uh, which challenged the widely held assumption that just because change is taking place at arguably a pace never before seen, a lot of folks assume that innovation and successful real innovation is as well. Well, hmm. the article pointed out just th that it's not, number one, and, and the leading example that Matt Ridley led off with was think about your travel time. You know, if you if, uh, from from start to finish, the time if you're flying to Toronto, if you're flying to Miami, you don't get there any faster. And in fact, it could be argued, depending on the model of aircraft you take, you may get there slower because they're they're flying slower to conserve fuel. Uh, the Concorde, which was the world's fastest ever uh, aircraft, has been retired. So things to think about. But I, I digress. Uh, the article really pointed out how uncomfortable industry and government is at experimenting. And of course, experimenting is so critical to successful innovation. I'm going to give you an example, Greg, and I'm going to get your, your take here. So uh, Jeff Bezos, you can't get through maybe a conversation about innovation without maybe having uh, the big A way in. But I like this one here. Jeff Bezos said, quote, being wrong might hurt you a bit but being slow will kill you. If you can increase the number of experiments you try from a hundred to a thousand, you, dram you dramatically increase the number of innovations you produce, end quote. Now, think about Thomas Edison. He and his team of engineers, when they were trying to develop the nickel iron battery, do you take a guess of how many experiments, Greg, that their team had to take to get it right. I can't even imagine with Thomas Edison involved, he was the great experimenter. I mean, it was almost like he didn't even care about the success. <laughs> 50,000 experiments. Wow. I would have never guessed even that high. And that is one of the things. And to your point, he was, of course, he was involved in a lot of projects, but that led to his famous quote, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So Greg, is innovation uh, lagging behind as, as, uh, as counterintuitive for many folks that would seem? What, what's your take on the state of innovation? I, it's definitely lagging in large companies. The same companies that will struggle with the end, quote unquote, the end of the office, um, will, will struggle with innovation, particularly in this new, in these new environs. Right, the innovation is about risk, as you just said, and the reason, and you know that I feel strongly about this. I'll use a stronger word: disruption. The reason that I chuckle or sometimes openly laugh um, at large companies who talk about disruption is that they can't do it. I, I will, to, to my dying day, I will say that you are either th those who are about to be disrupted or the disruptor, but you are not both a leader in the marketplace and a disruptor. It's impossible to do that because of exactly what you just talked about. You have to take risks, lots of risks, lots of risks that could impact the effectiveness of your operations that could negatively impact your bottom line that could negatively impact your identity or your your image in the marketplace. All of those things are great risks to companies these days, and they're not willing and they're not going to be willing to take it because 
when your stock drops 40% in a day, you change course really, really rapidly. Excellent point. And, you know, that's, uh, I love the holistic approach. Innovation is one of those warm, fuzzy conversations oftentimes that, that, uh, folks weigh in on the obvious things, but you don't always think about some of the, some of the aspects of innovation and taking risks that you just shared. And, and especially for these bigger companies, you know, it's not as simple as, Hey, let's come up with the latest iPhone. It, it doesn't work like that. So, um, by the way, uh, the dog says that James Dyson created 5,126 prototypes of the cyclone vacuum in his backyard shed. The 5,127th edition change the industry that is doggedness if i've never seen it knowing no pun, james dyson no pun intended. he's got all 5126 <laughs> still in his somewhere that's right hey we're gonna have to wrap up uh of the discussion here but i want to go back to one more thing memory shared going back to the offices virtual offices will also help reduce the amount of paperwork generated in offices as well as prepping for those long meetings that we don't miss. Amen to that. Raise your hand if you've ever been into a a, a two hour meeting when it could have been done in ten minutes. Yeah, or we've all been email. there. I mean, <laughs> you know, I've re we've recently read articles where that's exactly the feeling that people have is that this could have been done in an email. That's right. Can I can I punt just a few seconds on meeting? Sure. I will strongly encourage everyone who wants to have a meeting to state a goal, not an agenda a specific outcome and create accountabilities in that meeting. And if you cannot do that, do not have that meeting. I, I in my history, used to, um, still do actually, but I um, have a lot more meetings these days. In any business meeting, if you did not state a goal, have action and accountability, I would not attend. Um, you know, being in my role, that was easier to, to accomplish than most people, but you can tactically challenge your organization to be more effective with meetings. Nobody else is enjoying the meeting. You are you are working on your email in either. So um, make that a diplomatic challenge in your in your business. Uh, and Clay says no more meetings. No more meetings. That's what Clay's weighing in on LinkedIn Live. What's that? <laughs> oh, did he? <laughs> All right. So, uh, and Amanda over here to to my right says he deleted it really quickly because they've got a standing Monday meeting. So we'll we'll see how we we change that <laughs> internally. Yeah. Now no we love career limiting moves on the air. <laughs> no, we we love our team here at Supply yeah. Chain now, and we try to streamline it. Okay. But I love the spirit. I mean, that's right. No more terrible meetings. Let's qualify it slightly, but he's dead on, and that's, that's how right. people feel too. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, so as much fun as we're having, we're at about an hour and two minutes, so we're going to wrap up here with just a couple of high fives uh, and some quick resources. So, Greg, man, what an uh, incredible episode two of our Supply Chain Trivia Challenge that we held last week. Yeah. Uh, and our new champion is Kobe Cannoli, who got uh, every single question right. Wow, that's every impressive, and I'm taking that as a personal challenge. That isn't going right. to happen again. Kobe threw down the gauntlet. Yes, he did. Uh, so new champ there. Congrats. Also finishing second was Antonio Rivera, part of the EL Green EAL Green team. Yeah. Uh, uh, Claudia's colleague. So representing EAL Green well. So congrats, Antonio. Well, you know what? Antonio and uh, Haride, they finished tied for second. So yeah. technically this is uh, first place and two – uh, folks that tied at second place. So yeah, congrats right. all. Pretty impressive showing. And also uh, our previous uh, winner, Demetrios Koulos, Mr. Inventory, finished in the top five. That's right. Dude's like the, he's like the Tiger Woods of supply chain. <laughs> if he ain't winning, he's close, right? That's right. Uh, and he was wearing, I'm sure, his uh, Sunday red Sunday jersey. red. That's right. Yeah. Uh, man. What I what I would pay to see some real live golf with Tiger Woods on Sunday these days. Hopefully, we'll get into the new normal soon enough. Hey, if hey. you can settle for um, if you can settle for Ricky Fowler, by the way, <laughs> he did a little he did a little uh, charity thing um, the other day, and it I think it's it's on YouTube or Twitter or something like that. Pretty I gotta have, I gotta have the real stuff, man. All Sunday right. afternoon, yeah. Masters, going for broke, right? Uh, but it'll missing be here a, soon enough. Missing a putt and costing yourself a million dollars. 
<laughs> yeah. All right. So our next game. So if you if you're digging our uh, supply chain trivia, join us for the third installment. We're really pleased to be collaborating with Jenny Froome and the Sapix team on June third. We kick off nine thirty a.m. because this is our Eastern Hemisphere edition, right? Uh, we're yeah. trying to uh, experiment with some time frames so that folks really globally can weigh in and enjoy it and, and take part in the friendly competition. Uh, so folks like Memory don't have to stay up until all points of the evening to play s- some of our additions that are, you know, uh, that kick off in the late afternoon here. Or so Reday, who was doing it at three o'clock in the morning. His that time. is right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, so kudos to our winners uh, and to all of our attendees. Join us on, on June 3rd, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time as we kick off round three. And you can go to supplychainnowradio.com to learn more about that. And, uh, Greg, tell them about this webinar coming up on May 27th, uh, about a, uh, 10 days from now. Yeah, so uh, Gartner's uh, Supply Chain Top 25 for 2020 is about to come out. I believe it comes out on the 18th or 19th and they'll have a brief discussion on it, but we're meeting with the curator, leader, and um, top analyst, Mike Griswold, on May 27th to discuss some key takeaways. So as we've been encouraging people, it matters not how big, how small, how advanced, how laggard your company is. Tune into this, get some of these takeaways, learn from someone who was first a a practitioner then an analyst and now premier industry expert on um, supply chain. Learn what it can mean for your company. And and this is a live stream. So you'll be able to interact with us and and with Mike to, um, you know, get additional knowledge out of it. So uh, first of all, this is something that happens every year. It's what it's what the supply chain industry has waited for every year. It's a great honor for us to have Mike and Gartner um, allow us to to partner with them on this this topic and and help get the word out around the world. Absolutely. May 27th, free webinar. Come join us. There'll be takeaways and best practices regardless of your role and what size of business you're in. Uh, And Mike always delivers. You can learn more and register for this free offering at SupplyChainNowRadio.com. Hey, uh, before we depart... Uh, Greg, our friend, our buddy, our pal, Fred Tolbert, said this. No more meetings because it gives more time to listen to Supply Chain Now. Hear, hear, Fred. <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't throw that up uh, graphic fast enough, but uh, glad you're, you're tuned in once again. And we look forward to a couple of upcoming episodes uh, with our friend Fred. Right, Greg? Yes, sir. I do. I, I Look, Fred comes from the planning industry, competitive company to mine. But we're friendly competitors, and I'm always pulling for him because he's he's a planning forecasting guru. Yes, he is. Yes, and, and he's an Apex Hall of Fame legend. Yeah, and so, facilitating youth in supply chain. So we're all about that. Doing good stuff. Yep. All right. So uh, at an hour and eight minutes, we're going to wrap it up here today. We could easily go in a couple more, couple more hours with some of the engaged folks. I got that- time. <laughs> All right. So to our listeners, uh, hey, check us out at supplychainnowradio.com, a wide variety of resources and webinars and events, and certainly no shortage of thought leadership via our podcast and our live streams, of course, our webinars. Find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. And, you know, Greg, uh, an interesting individual, in case we have anyone that wants to figure out how to collaborate with us, you can shoot a note to amanda at supplychainnowradio.com, right? Yeah. It's Fire just that away. easy. She is a p- trained professional and she knows how to get our attention. <laughs> That's right. So that wraps up today's episode of the Supply Chain Buzz. Hey, Greg, why don't you take us out? Hey, if you like this uh, and you'd like to see some of our video vlogs or listen to our podcast, you can always come to supplychainnowradio.com or wherever you get your podcast, whatever platform or YouTube. If you want to watch us on video, we're much prettier on a podcast, I can tell you. Um, Look, difficult times. I feel it. I don't know about you all, but I feel it. I feel like we're starting to come out of it. Um, We've got some good, successful, and prudent initiatives to start to get back to work in a safe way. Um, Keep your chin up, right? Brighter days do, as my friend Scott always says, lie ahead and be safe. Be careful, but 
join us here and learn about the future and the now of supply chain. Love Thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.